time to have an emphatically zero BS conversation about modifying your vehicle. When is it a good idea and when is it not? We'll deep dive right into that. That's next. I'm John Cadogan from autoexpert.com.au and I get new cars cheap for buyers here in Australia. Website for that, obviously, or you can just click the card that's up there now, dude. Okay, so modifying your car in just a second. Now, the reason these latest videos are kind of unscripted, I don't know if you like them or not, some people like them, some people hate them, tomato, tomato. It's because I'm turning that half of the fat cave that you never see into a kind of fabrication shop and it's consuming a shit ton of my time, as they say, okay? And I'll show you some of that directly. It'll be part of the show in future. I want to get into a bit more DIY stuff, frankly, because there's so many people out there doing it badly, slash unsafely, unprofessionally, whatever. So I want to get into some of that and it'll have automotive applications and also just bloke tech applications, right? You want to drill a hole in a piece of metal and you're a little bit unsure about that. I've been doing that since I was 15. So we'll cover off some stuff of that nature. Now, before we get into modification, if you are a regular viewer of this fine channel, your heart will be as heavy as a field of butterflies in spring, even on lockdown, to go to ford.com.au slash SUV slash Everest. Yeah. And just scroll yourself about two-thirds of the way down there and have a little look at the latest depiction of Everest Base Camp, a video I covered, uh, a vehicle, sorry, that I covered off a few videos back, right? The video concerned the depiction of Everest Base Camp like this, okay? And the problem with that is that roof rack from Rhino cannot actually carry that stuff. Okay, that, that is an absolutely false depiction of what that roof rack can in fact carry. And when you go to the Ford website today, to that uh, slash SUV slash Everest page and scroll down and look at the new depiction of that vehicle, it's been cleaned up via the high-tech miracle of Photoshop, obviously, and it's a little bit more in line with what's actually possible because that Rhino rack with that awning, it's essentially the world's most expensive light bar in the context of heavy hauling things for your expedition, right? And I'll take that as a sincere endorsement of the views expressed in that video. Like Ford can continue not to engage with me if that is its want. It's got this multi-person PR department and What's got me stuffed about PR in Australia, and I've been interfacing, if that's the right word, with PRs in the automotive domain since the 90s, okay? And I've seen the trend away from actually trying to get the point across in the news domain to developing like a sinister clutch of tame journalists who only say nice things, who get led around by the snout from event to event, and they just sing from the hymn book. And it's frankly disgusting as a disservice to you. So if I were in PR, I would A, end my life, but and then I would engage with the journalists who are critical of my brand. I really would, because only positive things can flow from that. I mean, the worst thing that can happen is nothing. Okay, And the best thing that can happen is you open the door to some dialogue between the company and malevolent influencers such as me. And I say that, you know, somewhat flippantly because I'm not a malevolent influence. I'm a pro-consumer influence. I point out anti-consumer behavior and I don't give a shit what the companies think, right? So in this kind, against this kind of backdrop, this is what's happened in the background in relation to Everest Base Camp. And I'm overjoyed that this is a step from anti-consumerville here towards at least ethical conduct. It's not a big step in the right direction, but it's a step. And I'll take it however I can get it. And I'll take that as a sincere endorsement, and so should you. Anyway, go to ford.com.au slash SUV slash Everest and have a little look at that. I think that's a remarkably good development in the domain of truth in advertising, let's say. Okay, so let's talk about modification now because I got this message from a dude named Gary Shepard today and I'll get a bit of time for this because 
in my mind's eye, I see all of these blokes sort of broadly my age or a bit younger, you know, we were all around when there were dinosaurs and you're on lockdown and the last thing you want to do is inflict yourself on your family 24-7 because they don't deserve that. You're normally out doing, you know, high level stuff or something. And now what are you doing? You're sitting on your ass and you're watching modification porn and you're dreaming of this and that. At least that's what I'm inferring Gaza is doing. And here's the first part of a multi-pronged question which he posed to me earlier today by email. I've ordered a new Triton via your service, thanks, but have some questions that you might be able to shed some light on. I've been doing research, i.e. looking at a million YouTube videos, and there's a lot of advice out there about modifying your car for touring and a bit of four-wheel drive work. I hear about things like catch cans, custom-made dyno tunes, fuel pre-filters, two-inch lifts, GVM upgrades, etc. Okay, so, like I said, there is a tsunami of modification porn out there. And in the background, what happens, of course, is that you're in the YouTube uh, website and you have a little look for catch can or GVM upgrade and before you know it, you're three hours down this rabbit hole of modifying your four-wheel drive, in this case, Gary's case, right? He doesn't even have it yet. He's awaiting his Triton and he's downloading modification porn into his cognitive whatever and tossing up the concept of doing this, okay? And of course, YouTube's AI goes, Gaza is logged in as Gaza. And I can tell, this is the AI talking to itself, presumably, I can tell that Gaza loves this shit, so I'm just going to suggest more and more and more of that crap. And before you know it, Gaza has spent three weeks, right? He hasn't eaten and he, he hasn't drunk anything and he hasn't eaten and his family haven't seen him. He's been missing in action for three weeks watching modification porn. Okay, so that's thing number one to bear in mind about doing quote-unquote research of this nature. And I'd suggest that there needs to be a rationale for modifying your vehicle, okay? And the, the rationale has to be, in, in, in a sane universe, if you buy a vehicle and you discover that it cannot do something that you require it to do, and you can modify it in some way and make it do that, then, okay, do it if that's really important to you. I'd suggest it'd be better to go back upstream if you could go back in time and say, just buy a different vehicle that would do those things in standard trim. That's gonna be better for you. It's a cheaper option. It will probably be better integrated if you get it straight from the factory like that. But not everybody does that. And sometimes, you know, you, you think you're gonna do one thing with the vehicle and something happens and you discover yourself driving off road more often. You move to... I don't know, you have the tree change or the sea change or something and you find yourself in the bush or at the beach, driving up the beach to your favourite fishing spot, whatever. And these mods can be many and varied. They could be as simple as just changing the tyres or it could be the full ARB pimp. You know, Not that I recommend that. It's usually a mistake. You usually don't need that shit. But sitting there without the vehicle and without a real appreciation for what the vehicle is capable of, going down this track of the modifications that you plan is invariably a mistake. So I just want to run you through that list that uh, Gary talked about, which was catch cans, okay? Now, the purpose of a catch can is to purportedly prevent your inlet tract from getting all clogged up, clogged up, clagged up, whatever. Should have stopped at half a friggin' bottle, shouldn't I? Anyway... All right, that might help. The purpose of a catch can is to stop your inlet tract from getting all clagged up with all of those things that it sucks on because your inlet tract in a diesel particularly is not just sucking air, right? It's sucking a little bit of oily crankcase vapour through the PCV system, the positive crankcase ventilation system, and it's also sucking a fair bit of exhaust gas through the exhaust gas recirculation system. And both of these systems exist so that we inflict less pollution on humanity generally. And there's a case for EGR also at uh, low throttle loads, okay? So some real brainiacs have worked out how to make diesel engines reasonably clean. And if you dick with these systems, you dick with that. So there's a moral case for not doing that. But anyway, 
if your engine proves itself susceptible to being clagged up in this way, then maybe there's a case for catch cans, but there's certainly not a case for fitting a catch can the minute your vehicle drives off the showroom floor. And I'd further suggest that one of the principal reasons that inlet tracks get clagged up is because increasingly people in big cities buy vehicles like Tritons and they never get out on the open road and go for a long drive. So what happens is the oil in the sump gets diluted with uh, combustion byproducts, unburnt fuel, water, things of this nature. The oil gets thinner, it rises up in the sump and more of it gets sucked through the inlet. So a better countermeasure would be to just, if that's you using your vehicle like that a lot, then just get your oil changed twice as often. So instead of 12 months down the track, book it in at the dealership and just get the oil and filter changed every six months. And then you'll at least have undiluted fresh oil in the sump much more often, like twice as often. And the dilution effects will be diluted okay so that's kind of cool and the other countermeasure of course is to make the time to go for a drive once a month just head out there or something when you're allowed to do that and that will purify the oil because you'll be operating with the oil yes yes kill something every day would be my advice just to maintain operational proficiency now where were we Okay, so these longer drives on the highway, they uh, get your oil at a hotter temperature for a longer period of time, and those volatile combustion byproducts in the water, they just evaporate off and get burnt off, okay, through the PCV system, coincidentally. So they would be two better hedges for that gunking up of the inlet tract, at least in my view. Now, these other things, right, like uh, custom-made dyno tunes, we'll talk about that specifically in a minute, fuel pre-filters, like, this is another one of those things. A common rail diesel engine is entirely intolerant of any sort of contamination in the fuel in the high pressure region of the fuel rail. A, because the high pressure pump is a very precise device with uh, closely uh, rotating metal sort of cam surfaces and any gritty stuff that gets in there is gonna spoil the crap out of the uh, pump. And then there's that the danger of that grit getting into the injectors, which are really fine. Like, they've got, they've got very small holes in them down in the micron sort of domain. And if you get grit in there, that the injector's just a throwaway. So the filtration mechanism for uh, common rail diesel engines is already pretty well sorted out. And what you need to do is just conform to the service interval. And you should be perfectly okay as long as you're not using the vehicle in some sort of insanely dusty, filthy environment. And even then, if you are, the countermeasure would be more frequent servicing and change the fuel filters more frequently, okay? Like, how hard is this? You don't need an aftermarket fuel pre-filter to solve this problem. And to me, that would be like a last ditch effort. Anyway, uh, the whole thing about two inch lifts and GVM upgrades, like most drivers of most four by fours cannot exploit the full four by four capability of those vehicles off the showroom floor. They just can't. So the countermeasure there is get better training. Okay, get better off-road driver training. I've done a shitload of off-road driver training and it amazes me how far a standard vehicle like a Triton can go off-road. And the main limitation in many off-road situations is the highway-based tyres. So if it's really slippery, then in particular really muddy, then the tyres are going to fill up with mud. The tread voids will fill up with mud and you'll be driving on a set of slicks, which is... <laughs> interesting but certainly not as capable as that vehicle could be and in that case then yeah change the tires dude and that's not going to void the warranty and you'll get slightly better performance if you are going to change the tires though i'd suggest you have a careful think about where you're actually going to use that vehicle most of the time because if you're going to do a lot of highway driving and around town, then you might want to choose some tyres that give you a little bit more all-terrain performance without going the full mud-chugging bloody tyres. You know those big, chunky, mud-type tyres I'm talking about? Well, they're just 
awful to drive around town and they're even worse on the freeway. It's just appalling and they also don't stop or grip the road very well in those conditions. So, you know, you've got horses for courses, right? You might even consider having two sets of tyres. One for work, like running the kids around and just normal driving, and one for play. That could be a solution for you. As for the two-inch lift thing, though, most people who put two-inch lifts on their car, well, they already can't drive the vehicle to the limit of its capability, so it's kind of redundant. And it also ruins the highway handling. It just does. And that's quite dangerous when you're uh, around Skippy or something. It'd be good to be able to swerve to the full capability of the vehicle without having to, you know, run off the road and slide sideways into a tree, which is the door you're opening when you fit those two-inch lifts and tyres that don't really grip the road very well. You've got to also bear in mind that the electronic stability control system of the car and other systems, they're calibrated around the, the standard suspension calibration. So if you go and change that profoundly, you're also going to change the nature of ESC activation in unpredictable ways, not for the better, okay? So there's that. Gary goes on. All of which, he means the modifications, are said to improve the performance and ability of the vehicle. There is so much info out there that the average Joe doesn't know who to believe. Is it just BS by people trying to sell you stuff? There's a couple of important points there, and the first one is this improve the performance, okay? Because the performance of anything, like the engine performance or the drivetrain performance or the chassis, like handling performance of the car, it's already a trade-off, okay? It rolls off the line as a compromise. It's a compromise because the vehicle has to do some off-road driving and some highway driving and some wet driving and all of this different stuff, okay? And it has to be reasonably refined and your average buyer has to like it the way it is. And then if you improve the performance, Invariably, what you do is you stretch the performance of this bit of the performance, like the off-road performance. You might stretch the mud performance envelope of the vehicle, but at the same time, you shrink the highway performance of the vehicle because you can't have both. And the same thing with engines, right? You can pump up the outright kilowatt-type performance of the engine or you know mid-range performance, whatever, but you invariably impact things like durability, right? Because if you exploit more performance out of an engine, you are going to wear out the tyres quicker and put more stress on universal joints and more stress on elements of the powertrain. And it just depends, you know, a, a mild boost in engine performance might not affect those things that much. A serious boost really might affect those things. So you can't have a modification that makes everything better like it doesn't improve the performance what it does is it specifically improves a, a, an aspect of performance and invariably what they never say is other elements of performance get compromised okay you can't have this any other way that's it's intrinsic to the nature of engineering trade-offs right and the other thing gary said here about uh, you know is it just a bs by people trying to sell you stuff well if you want to understand bullshit and it is such a salient feature of our culture. Get this. On Bullshit by Professor Harry G. Frankfurt, right? He's a professor emeritus of philosophy at, I think it's Princeton University, one of the big unis anyway. And this is really the most interesting book on the subject that I have ever read, okay? On Bullshit. It's only 67 pages long and you can see that I've I've dog-eared them endlessly to refer back to the bits that kind of interest me. But the tiny pages, is only 67 pages. It's really just an essay. And he is a proper brainiac, okay? And if you don't want to read the whole book, the central overarching thesis of bullshit and, and how it differs from lies is that the liar has to respect the truth in order to misrepresent either the truth or what he believes the truth to be. Okay, so the liar is engaged in a process of active misrepresentation of the truth, whereas the bullshitter is doing something that's, in a sense, even less respectable and far more insidious, which is that the bullshitter just has his own agenda dear to his heart, and he can say anything, right? It can be true, 100% true, or 100% false, 
or any combination of that, right, any proportions of that. And the central overarching thing he does is just take falsehood and truth and bend it to promote his agenda. And you see politicians do this all the time, right? They use elements of the truth and elements of fal falsehood and they weld them together and they just vomit it all over you. And it's like wrestling with an octopus because they can defend the true bits. And that's often what they do in debates, okay? So I'd suggest that in the commercial world for this kind of modification crap, then the retailer really doesn't have your best interest at heart. Okay, the retailer has his best interest at heart. And that's what marketing is. It's a thousand reasons why you should buy this product and no admission of any deficiency whatsoever, which is patently absurd because every product has deficiencies, at least as many as the advantages, right? And you have to weigh them up and you have to say, yeah, I'm gonna go that way. Well, the people who are peddling this stuff, okay, they are bullshitters to the extent that selling the stuff to you is more important to them generally than is it dead right for you. And that means you have to do informational triage when you watch these endless <laughs> YouTube videos. And I know it's quite entertaining to do that, but there's a difference between just watching porn and then trying to act it out, right? And it's a much clearer distinction with actual porn. When it's modification porn, it's much easier to find yourself going down that road and getting Tiffany together with um, whoever and making shit happen. It's just much easier to enact it with modification porn, okay? So you really do have to have a filter for this stuff because often it is just, it's not just bullshit because there is a usage case for two inch lifts in four wheel drives. But I have to say, you'd have to be doing a shitload of really tough off-roading to need that extra two inch of lift, okay? And then you'd also need to fully acknowledge the deficiency in highway performance that invariably goes hand in hand with that two inch lift. So if all you're gonna do is tow a friggin' caravan to the Kimberley and go down the Gibb River Road and then drive down to Cable Beach from Derby or somewhere, watch the tide come in in Derby, it's pretty full on experience that is an amazing tide 10 point whatever it is three meters or something it's amazing okay and I get why people go there via dingo piss friggin creek okay but if that's all you're going to do you don't need that two inch lift and it is certainly not going to make your vehicle any better for that kind of driving which it can do on the standard tires and it can do with the standard suspension probably better than it can do with any sort of mod in that regard. A bit more from Gary now. Does it wipe out your warranty or is it perfectly safe? For instance, I emailed the DinoTune people featured on the four wheel drive 24 seven channel and they said with a properly done DinoTune, it would deliver more power, better response while saving fuel and would not affect the warranty. Other people in the comments section say you wouldn't be covered. It's so hard to know what to believe. Two points on this, okay? We'll get to warranty in just a second, but let's talk about the media and four-wheel drive 24-7, Ronnie Dahl and all these other YouTubers of that nature. And look, they do a good job, but it should not be forgotten that they are closely associated with the four-wheel drive aftermarket industry in the way that many motoring journalists are closely associated with the new car industry. And when you operate in that environment, you have to be entirely careful about the kinds of criticisms you voice, otherwise you don't get the opportunity to test other products. And often there are under the table sponsorship arrangements that go with quote unquote influences. And I'm not pointing the finger at Ronnie Dahl or four wheel drive 24 seven specifically. I'm just saying that you have to understand that channels of this nature in that genre work closely with those multi-million dollar businesses and they wouldn't be working closely with them unless the arrangement was mutually beneficial, okay? And that means that you have to do a degree of informational triage and ask yourself how impartial is the endorsement of those products. And by Im impartial, what I'm saying is if those dudes test a dyno tune, are they really putting their warranty on the line, okay? And 
are they only talking up the positives, for example? Or is there balanced criticism to go hand in hand with this stuff? So off the bat, I would suggest that one of the hardest things for a car maker to do is comply with emissions regulations. And emissions regulations are not just there to be a pain in the ass. They're there because exhaust emissions from vehicles are toxic and they actually cause more premature death than road trauma in our big cities. That's just a fact and you don't have to like it. So if you do retune, quote unquote, retune, remap, whatever, your engine, then you are by definition no longer compliant with that sort of certification that happened when the car was new. And you can hypothetically be pulled over and tested. And if you fail, it's a five figure fine. So you're running the gauntlet on that. And this bit here where Gary says, uh, you know, with a properly done dyno tune, it would deliver more power, better response while saving fuel and would not affect the warranty. This is like all the positives. Like, what's the negative? Okay. What's the powertrain durability going to be like if you add more kilowatts, more newton meters, whatever? Because if that engine is tuned to deliver a maximum of, I don't know, 450 newton meters, because inside the manufacturer's R&D facility, they know that that transmission or that transfer case or that differential, whatever, is only rated for 450 Newton meters. So they've tuned it to deliver that and no more. If you suddenly dyno tune that engine and come up with a miraculous 50 additional Newton meters, then that is likely to have a durability impact on the transmission or whatever the weakest link is, which they tuned it for in R&D, which they don't tell you about in the brochure, okay? So there's that. And on the issue of warranty and not affecting your warranty, okay? Read the book because warranty is not a monolith. And I think they are absolutely being truthful when they say that retuning the engine does not affect your warranty. But in practice, it does, okay? Because if you retune the engine and the paint starts to flake off the driver's door or something for no reason, just wasn't put on very well to start with and it's bubbling off or something, then obviously the retune doesn't affect the warranty like that. Or if you're driving down the road and something else happens, the chassis starts to rust, okay? That's not the engine retune. And obviously, there's no direct line that can be joined between retuning and the problem. But if you have had your engine retuned, okay, and the transmission shits itself between here and Dingo Piss Creek, the manufacturer will have one look at that vehicle and say, Sorry, dude, you're on your own. And I've seen this happen so many times with modifications, okay? If you put something non-standard on the vehicle and they can draw a reasonable line between the modification and the failure, then the warranty is not going to be honoured by them. That's just how this rolls. And in fact, car makers, many of them at least, enthusiastically search for this kind of dot joining sequence because it saves them thousands that is effectively what they would pay out in the price of parts and then paying for the labor at the dealership to do a warranty job so if they can join these dots you retune the engine where you can see evidence of that and then the rear differentials failed or the powertrains failed and so your transmission's gone poopy in its trousers they will sidestep that. And then you're going to be back to the dyno tuning guy and you're going to say, how dare you? And he's going to say, it's not my fault. Okay. And you're going to be stuck in this position where you're going to need a lawyer and experts and it's going to cost you 20 grand to get to the bottom of who is actually responsible for this failure. Like whose workmanship caused this device to fail? and there may not be anything you can do and you might have to just cop the whole thing on the chin. And this is the problem with these kinds of modifications and these claims that are made because the claims that are made in marketing brochures and websites and things of that nature, they're carefully thought through so that they can be defended. They can be absolutely defended and that doesn't stop them being bullshit, okay? Because bullshit can be self-serving truth, okay? 
The truth of engine modifications generally to increase the power output is that the durability of the powertrain suffers. And then when the powertrain shits itself, you're in no man's land because nobody wants to be accountable for the problem. It's like, not our fault, you know? And then you go next door and you say, but, and they go, not our fault, go back to him. And he goes, go back to him. And you're there going, bleh, 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 bleh. and it's really frustrating. So there's no reason to modify the engine of a four-wheel drive unless it has a deficiency that you need to overcome. And in the case of the Triton, it's the lightest of the utes, so it's just under two tonnes. I think it's 1,999 for the GSR. And it's 430 newton metres across that middle-of-the-range torque band, which makes it just as accelerative in that range as something like a Ranger, which is like 2.3 tonnes, but which makes 470 newton metres or whatever it is for the 3.2. Okay, if you compensate for the difference in the mass, then the performance is similar and do you really need to improve it? And if you do, then why don't you buy something else? Why don't you wait for a V6 Ranger, which is just around the corner, and it'll give you additional performance without stepping into no man's land between finger-pointing party A and finger-pointing party B, who are all going, <laughs> not my problem, I just sold you the vehicle, not my problem, I just retuned the engine, kind of thing, okay? Gaza concludes, would it be possible for you to do a YouTube video covering the most common mods and give your expert opinion as to whether they are worthwhile or are just BS? Do they void your warranty if they relate to the part that goes bad? Any advice would be appreciated. Thanks, mate. Cheers, Gaza. I think we just did, Gaza. But yeah, a lot of this stuff is just flat out. And what you're not doing, mate, and you really need to do this, and this is the advice I give to everyone, is choose a vehicle that's going to do what you need it to do standard, okay? That's always the cheapest way to do it, and it's always the most factory integrated and most reliable way of doing it. And then, and only then, modify it if you need to, if you really, really need to, to make something happen, and realise that many of the claims that are made in the marketing universe about the benefits of this modification and that modification do not acknowledge anything to do with the deficiencies that invariably go hand in hand with that because this could be the best, whatever it was, $14.99 or something that you ever spend. Like when I bought that book and I read it, henceforth light bulbs <laughs> just went off in my head. It's like, bing, ah yes. They're bullshitting me here. It's amazing. And then you know exactly what it means because with a gun to, to your head, okay, like most people know that there's a lot of bullshit in society. They just can't tell you exactly what it is. And there's the cure. So anyway, thanks for your question, Gaza. I think it points, uh, it points to a lot of people who are in exactly this position, you know, they're downloading modification porn now and their brainstem is being hacked by that because the more porn you watch, the more porn you want and then the more fantasies you have about enacting that in the real world and modification porn is just like all other kinds of porn, dude. It becomes an addiction and then, you know, you've got to acknowledge the problem and get help, which hopefully this video has been. I'll check you tomorrow. Thanks for watching.